Blake or the lake and, or my uncle George Douglas. I did try to bring him back tonight, but I was <laughs> going to do that. Was that really in the paper, saying that he was going to be here? I think it was in Peter Brogan's paper. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's a paper that I write for. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I was delighted because what this helps me to do uh, is do, do the ever, never ending sorting of material that I've inherited through my husband's family, through George Douglas um, and all his travels, and through the Mackenzies and the Greer. So we've got an awful lot of stuff in our attic, and maybe I'll just bring it all into Lakefield and let you people sort it. But anyway, I was glad to do this, and in talking to Bill this week, we came up with a sort of a, a pattern. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the wharf, and that was interesting because I knew absolutely nothing, including the date it was opened, but uh, I was told that uh, by Sheila, and that was a help, so I went down to the library about it. So, um, and I hope John David Grills does come because I have some comments to make about his grandfather, who was a, a wonderful canoe builder. These are comments that George Douglas made. Um, and although the topic is the wharf, I'd like to think of that as a kind of metaphor or um, centerpiece of this whole waterway. We think that probably every community in Ontario started on a water course somewhere. It needed to because it needed the water power for mills and for transportation. And Lakefield was no different. But <laughs> Lakefield has the, uh, we're all of course committed to this, it has the charm of being on lovely clean water to start with. Uh, if you go to Stratford, you know that lovely as that town is, the water is muddy. Um, and it, it's a, a Trent waterway that took a long time being built, but it, it is complete. Um, and it's something that, that's been very important to a lot of people. And we know that from the early settlers and the writers and the native people. So it's a very special waterway. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening, uh, I certainly don't want to do all the talking, and I know Bill is going to explain what he has in, in, on his display board, but I'd like uh, just to talk a little bit uh, about my uncle, about George Douglas, and many of you probably knew him. He was certainly a remarkable looking man. Um, Rob Gillett certainly knew him well, and <coughs> Rob's father and George were great correspondents, and their correspondence is actually in the Trent archives. It's interesting to read. But George married my mother's older sister, and their property, Northcote Farm, was just a few miles north of our farm, which was between what is now Stenner Road and the Grove School. So that's where I grew up. And the time that I didn't spend at the farm, I probably <coughs> spent up at Northcote. So it was a <coughs> experience for me. Um, George was a very tall, interesting looking man. How many did know him? Just out of curiosity. Oh, it's good. A number of people. It's great. Uh, tall and posing. I've brought three albums that you might like to look at afterwards. He was a photographer, among many other skills that he had. And uh, he printed his own pictures and often printed many, many copies. So over the years, I've finally put these together into three albums. And they're really interesting to look at and to see what Northcote Farm was like. And it's still like in many ways. It, it's still a wonderful piece of property. So I'll talk a bit about him and some of his comments. He luckily left a lot of letters and diaries, and although my aunt did get rid of some of those, uh, and I wish I knew what was in the ones she got rid of, but she did save a lot, and many of his letters he wrote on pads with carbon so that they were the carbon copies, and we were able to look at those. Um, but I'll start by just telling you what I found out about the wharf, and I thought, you know, things don't change at all. It, the, the players change, but the script is still the same with politicians. And, uh, no, I don't think Peter Adams is in the audience tonight or any other. Well, we have a local politician. He would like to have been here. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, it opened, as you probably know, on May 24th in 1909. Um, that happened to be a very important long weekend in Peterborough because that was the opening of the armories. And armories were opening right across country, or certainly across Ontario in that period, um, and they spent about four years trying to get the armories going in Peterborough, but finally it was on the 24th of May, and the uh, Minister of Public Works, Dr. Pugsley, and I don't know anything about Dr. Pugsley, but he came for this great event. Well, the Honourable J.R. Stratton, who was the um, editor and owner of the Peterborough Examiner, and I think a consummate politician, and also 
very concerned about the Trent Canal and getting this whole thing settled, which had started back in the 1830s. So he arranged <coughs> to bring Dr. Pugsley out on a steamer. And I don't know which steamer. I haven't been able to find that out yet, but maybe on the Stony Lake. They didn't get here till 4.30 in the afternoon on the 24th of May because they spent all that day um, doing things at the armories. And that evening they had a wonderful, wonderful banquet in the Oriental Hotel with all kinds of toasts and, um, and drinks and speeches and so on. But Pugsley got out here at 4.30 and the town band was there to greet him and all the citizens. Um, and <clears throat> he said in his address, this fine wharf is largely due to the business insight, no, sorry, he didn't say this, but Stratton said this, this fine wharf is largely due to the business insight of Dr. Pug Pugsley and his interest in Lakefield. Um, a lot of sort of political speeches going on here. Uh, C.A. Tanner was the ma um, master of ceremonies. Um, so all those people made speeches, um, and they only had about an hour and a half to do this. <clears throat> and Reeve Kidd got up and reminded Dr. Pugsley that there'd been a recent deputation to Ottawa to talk about a further extension of the wharf. It was lovely that they were getting it, but would you please add a little more <laughs> so that passengers that could get off the train on the spur line and get right into the steamer. And uh, Bill has a very good picture of that taken from my father's album in 1918. But, and we have an earlier picture of 1913, so that extension came before too many years happened. Um, and the Reeve quoted from this speech, which I guess uh, <clears throat> was written by somebody in the village. Uh, he's confident that it could be done, that really, Dr. Pugsley, you could find that money and put that extension in. <laughs> um, and there was a, a board of trade, which I didn't realize, at Lakefield at that time, and Mr. Moore was the president of that, and he thanked Stratton for his fine words that he gave. And he said to, and he said to Stratton, I thought this was lovely, I hope you will be spared to serve the West Riding of Peterborough with a responsible overflow of interest in the village and the country at large, the county at large, sorry. So, <laughs> lovely, lovely words they used back in 1909. And Stratton's, um, or, um, sorry, Dr. Pugsley's reply to Stratton's wonderful words were, Nothing is too good for the residents of Lakefield. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so you might just remind you. <laughs> um, and not only that, but Lakefield will be one of the main ports between Georgian Bay and the St. Lawrence River. Can you imagine that? So that's what they, they were thinking of I mean, back in those days. Um, so that, but there wasn't a lot in the papers. I went through the three... Peterborough Papers, The Examiner, The Morning Times, and The Review, they all had masses of pictures about the armories and just a little bit about Lakefield. And that made me realize that I don't know <coughs> where, <coughs> excuse me, where all the Lakefield papers are kept, the old ones. <coughs> Do you have an archives of old papers anywhere? Trent Valley Archives. Uh, I should go in there. So I think it would be a, a really interesting little study or paper for someone to write um, maybe we can do this for next year because there was nothing in um, uh, Angus's book the valley of at least not the valley of the Trent the respectable ditch about the Trent Canal <coughs> it didn't mention anything about the government wharves that were built and in 1911 there were two more built at Mount Julian and at Juniper Island so it was obviously something the government was doing and it would be interesting to know when did they start? Did they worry about the fish hatchery? Could they pour cement at any time of the year? I, I don't imagine they did. It opened in May. Could they have started that year or did they start earlier? So maybe I'll take that on as a little project and look at the old Lakefield papers. Anyway, um, William uh, Sharon, who was the clerk, read a, uh, another pre prepared speech to Dr. Pugsley. We are hopeful that in the next estimates of the Department of Public Works that this extension to the wharf will be done for Lakefield. And Dr. Pugsley replied, um, uh, I wish I had time for a longer visit. I would like to be here longer. But um, and, and 20 years, I have been very careful in regard to promises. But uh, I am hopeful that there will be increased revenues next year and that you will indeed get your extension. <laughs> <laughs> they, they still talk the same way, don't they? <laughs> anyway.
Anyway, he arrived by steamer, he went back by train at 6.30 and presumably had a delightful time at the Oriental Hotel. Um, but I did find one interesting thing, um, uh, just forward, I think it was in the examiner, that Lakefield had a, um, I, I don't know whether it was a council meeting or what, just that very same weekend or a few days after, on how they were going to celebrate Dominion Day, which I still like to call it, 1st of July. Uh, they formed an executive committee, a finance committee, a sports committee, an illuminated canoes committee, and an illuminated Canada Parade committee. So, do you think the village could do that now? <laughs> do that for the 1st of July? Anyway, Not that's what I found. Hmm? Not with the fence there. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so, um, that's what I found out about the wharf. <clears throat> There's still lots of things, certainly, to know about it. <clears throat> um, the few readings that I'm going to give you are just um, bits and pieces of, from, as I say, the things that George kept, or what he wrote, and luckily my aunt kept. My aunt was 22 years younger than Uncle George, <clears throat> and she lived to be almost 100, so she had a number of years to put all these papers together, and the family is forever grateful to her. Um, but George, for those who don't know him, and, and as a reminder to those who did know him, he was a great canoeist. He had been at the Rithcote Farm from the age of nine to 19. Um, so there were very important years for a young boy. And he learned to paddle, he learned to shoot, he, uh, to ski, to skate, um, and just generally to be out of doors. And, uh, and, and became a, an excellent photographer. He was an engineer by training, but uh, his photographs were just outstanding. And, Fortunately, my aunt left a lot of them with me and the, the, the glass plate negatives, which we slowly have printed, but they're, they're very expensive to have uh, printed. So I'm going to start here with something. This is from a 1903 letter. George came back, and I'm trying not to give you too many details, but to give you some sense. The family left Northcote Farm in uh, night. 1894. Mrs. Douglas had died. She was 49. I think she probably had tuberculosis and she'd had her last child rather late in life and wasn't very well. So she died. They went back to, they went to England where Dr. Douglas was a, a medical officer, a retired medical officer in the British Army and he got another posting. But, and then George finished his engineering, engineering training in England and went to sea to get um, his ticket for handling engines, decided that the oceans were far too boring and he really wanted to come back to inland waters. <clears throat> and he worked, most of his working life, he worked for a cousin who owned very uh, well-to-do mines, silver and copper mines in uh, uh, oh, Arizona and Mexico. Uh, but George would get back here every so often. Well, 1903 was the first year he came back, he'd come back to this part of the world since he left in, in 1894. And he writes here, I went to Lakefield by the train. There are three trains a day there now. And the train crosses the river by the Auburn Mills instead of backing away out as it used to. And people have explained that to me, and I still haven't quite figured that out, but um, and this isn't the time to get an answer to that probably, but there was another station, I think, than the, uh, over in East City. Um, they put in a new bridge there. The river between Peterborough and Lakefield has changed indeed, being now all, can I'm never sure how to pronounce this, canalized or canalized, anyway, a lot of canals, uh, with dams and locks so that there are no more rapids except the straight fall of the dams. And when he left, of course, none of the locks were in on that stretch of river. A new station at Lakefield, too. When I crossed the road to the hotel, the place seemed curiously familiar. I got a horse and buggy after dinner at the hotel, which Colonel Gibson used to run. Uh, used to run. Now it is kept by Craig, who used to have a confectioner and restaurant in Peterborough. Some of these names are, don't mean anything to me, uh, which you may remember. He's writing this letter to, back to England to his father. I drove out to the Lefevers, and that's a, a name associated with the Grove School and with the Strickland um, Farm. Um, gentlemen's farmers school back in the 1860s and 70s and then went on to the Greaves and the Greaves were another family um, uh, past my uh, family's place uh, one of these typically 
British families that comes out here with no apparent means, but they're very well born, and I don't, and I expect somehow to live off this land. And the Greaves were like that. Um, and Dr. Douglas, uh, George's father, and Colonel Greaves were great friends. The road is quite unchanged, except for a row of poles carrying the wires from Young's Point, from the generating station to the cement mills, back to the village then to see the cement work. So wherever George was, he went to see what was there, particularly things that were moving, like trains and streetcars, electric uh, rail lines, boats. He was interested in all of that. Next day, I got a skiff, and I rode up to Northcote Farm. You have no idea what a lovely country this is. I always thought my idea of it might be prejudiced in its favor, but it is not. It, it, it is perfectly lovely. The back bay at the farm uh, was full of logs. I ran over them, pleased to find that my feet had not lost their cunning at this old favorite pastime. <laughs> and there's some wonderful pictures in the albums that I brought of Northcote Farm and the, the huge logging runs that went down there. And I just remember, Michael probably is too, the um, concrete bases that were there still in Ketchewanooka. And I do remember the odd boom. But the boom left, yeah. Yes, but I, I don't remember any of the log drives. Um, I rode on then and had my lunch at Polycow Island, and you probably all know what Polycow Island is. And then on to Young's Point, which looks the same except for the powerhouse of the cement works, a single 350 kilowatt generator. That's the sort of thing he'd be interested in. Uh, so it's not a very large outfit. This, the st this stands where the old sawmill was. I went on to Hell's Gate. Well, that's way up uh, past Clear Lake into Stony Lake uh, on what used to be the Mary Ellen, now reconstructed and called the Majestic. The Majestic is the island that Michael Townsend lives on, or his parents did. Um, that's another whole story. <laughs> um, I rode on from Hell's Gate to, he called it Julian's Landing, which is what Mount Julian was called then, and I put up at a very nice little summer hotel run by Willie Graham. And I think that's the Graham who then started Viamede, where you could stay for a dollar a day. Uh, you couldn't get anything for a dollar any, <laughs> doing anything at Viamede now, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> Stony Lake is very considerably built up. But Clear Lake is quite unchanged. Uh, I thought, but if he could only come back now, well, I'm glad he isn't coming well, he back can. now. <laughs> and then what, what my aunt did with the diaries and letters um, is she took out the topics and she put them into little notebooks like this. So I'm just going to give you a few readings about Lakefield uh, and the date. And um, uh, this is about the police chief. This is 1889. I think I think this is probably Mrs. Douglas's letter to George, who was away at school at TCS in Port Hope. The village is quite excited over Scrimmager impounding the stray cows. He had put 16 in one day and 10 the next. <laughs> Scrimmager was the one and only police officer in the village. Um, George had a younger brother, Lion, who, um, and they both loved living in this area, as you can imagine, and they both had their early education at the Grove, which was called Lakefield Preparatory School in those they days. They paddled to school. Yes, they did. <laughs> yes, they did. They didn't paddle, they walked. And it, it's incredible when you begin to think of this. Father, Lion, and I to Peterborough on Friday in the Red Cutter. This was uh, in the uh, in late December. No, it isn't in December at all. It's in, what is the month? Yes, it is. It is in December, it's still 1889. Lovely slang and the trees looking so pretty, covered with ice from the blizzard of Wednesday. The lake is frozen across today, but I don't think it will bear. I don't think it will bear weight. And the lake very seldom froze across at Northcote, and George loved to paddle. It didn't matter what the weather was like or the season. Um, in fact, one of the family traditions, and Michael might remember this, he'd take us out paddling on New Year's Day. My mother and I paddled from Young Point to Northcote. One New Year's Day. Did you? Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Oh, 48 or 9. Oh. Um, in 1890, Father and I, Father and Lion drove to the village. They almost called Lion, although they just shortened it to Lion. They said it looked desolate after the fire. There was a fire in 1890. Uh, Tanner's, Hendren's, Cotton's old shop, and Webster's all burned down, and the milliners. We never heard anything about it. We are so far out of everything. Um, North Farms only few miles north of the village, but that's long before any kind of communication. Um, 
That was the end of 1890, and now in 1891, Father and Lion had a lovely skate nearly to Lakefield. On uh, Father's, and the next day, Father skated to the village and called for Lion on the way back. Uh, roads are dreadful. Um, by, uh, by the, oh, at the bottom of the Lefevre Hill, and I think that would be at the bottom of what we now call the Grove Hill. Um, <coughs> and the point I'm making with some of these readings is that the water was very important, water travel, because the roads were dreadful. This time of year, the uh, bottom would be out of it, frost is coming out, and it would take days and hours, and sometimes you just couldn't get through. Um, okay, uh, Dr. Douglas did a lot with Chautauqua meetings and the Mechanics Institute, which got started, but he was got annoyed because they never fed him. He came home hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 1893, this is just a year before they left, Arthur Strickland's canoe factory has been burnt down. The dynamos were kept there, and they're burnt up, so the village is in dark. Well, that's kind of an interesting picture of what things would look like. Um, 1894, this is not long before they leave for England. Father rode to Lakefield and then walked to Peterborough. So, <laughs> how many of us do that? <laughs> Uh, I hate rowing anyway, I love paddling, but I hate rowing. But, um, and I might walk to Peterborough, but I don't think I'd ever do both of those. Um, and the last <clears throat> one from here, um, this is 1894, just a month before they left. Went to Lakefield to Gordon's, that's the, the canoe builder. Uh, paddled around the, that point and down that bay. Now, I'm thinking that's up by the Narrows. I think that's what he's talking about. Um, by the end of Lefevre's Lake. And I'd never heard that part of the lake called that. I don't know. <coughs> the Lefevre's lived at a house called Uplands, which is all part of the Grove School now. Um, but there were only two houses at that time. There was Uplands and there was Ben Dennis, which belonged to the Tate family. And E.R. E. Tate was one of the owners of the canoe company. Well, and, and, and the Grove. Yes, and the Grove was there, yes. Um, that was all. Um, and you can just see that in some of the pictures that I brought. And the Atwood House probably too? Uh, yes, that's right. The Atwood House yeah. would have been built by then. Well, wasn't the, the Fever House on the west, to the east side of the, of the, uh, of the highway? Is it cut through the Grove? On the east side? No, west. Right on the corner, Michael, where, where you, just up from where you mm -hmm. live there? Yeah. Wasn't oh. that Colonel the Fever's house? No. No, no. It, they lived... Um, they say this place called Uplands, and I think they named all of these after something they'd known in England. Uh, it's a, I don't know if it's any particular style, uh, a center hole, large um, stucco? Uh, or, yellow brick. Um, yellow brick. The same, the same as the Grieve House. Oh, that's right. Up by Melody. Um, this is a typical George Douglas diary account, and there are pictures to illustrate this. The large picture in the back panel there is a, it looks like two terrified men sitting they're badly positioned in a canoe with no life belts, shooting down the rapids below the dam, just past the locks. Well, it, it, they were quite foolish. One of them was English, so maybe he didn't know any better. But these were two masters of the Grove, a man called Tom Wood and another one, Frank Duxbury, who was always called the Duke, the, the Dux being Latin for Duke. Anyway, um, this was middle of April, April 18th, 1937. Dull and cool with light wind from the north, clearing to sunshine later, but overcast with northwest wind before sunset. George always wrote down in great detail what was happening with the weather. I made an early start down the lake in the Daphne. The Daphne is a light 15-foot flush batten canoe, long unused. I had a pleasant trip with a light fair wind and swift current and most delightful of early spring conditions. Tom and the Duke were ready with their canoe at the Grove Wharf, and we started from there promptly, as agreed upon. We paddled right down to the Lakefield Powerhouse Dam and portaged the canoes to the nearest place below where we could embark with safety. And not too safe at that, as the event showed. I started out first with the Daphne and landed below the swift water to take a picture of the others as they came down. I turned just in time to see them crawling ashore in a badly waterlogged condition they emptied the water out of their canoe and they made a fresh start. I had plenty of time to take a picture of them as they came down. 
Then I learned that they had upset just as they were getting into the canoe. They had lost some of their stuff. And the rest, including themselves, was, of course, soaking wet. Before starting, I had been on the point of asking the Duke to give me his movie camera so I could take a picture of them with that. Now I regretted I had not done so, as the camera got wet and was out of business for the rest of the trip. <laughs> I think George uh, was almost delighted when somebody got into some sort of trouble. Um, I mean, he wasn't malicious about it at all, but he knew how to handle a, a canoe. Uh, We're still trying, Kathy. I was paddling on the lake on Sunday. Oh, uh, well, Michael's keeping up the family tradition. <laughs> That's great. Um, this, uh, this was a later letter to um, um, another Mackenzie relative who bought one of George's canoes to Jack Ryder, Mike, uh, and he's describing his flesh batten. Um, the 16-foot canoe you wanted for yourself is a Gordon flat model made of old-time basswood, flesh batten, varnished inside and painted green outside, and really beautifully built, very light, a delicate yet strong boat that should be well taken care of. I got this canoe a long time ago, but it has been used only a few times and it has spent its life out in my barn where it is now. Um, George ended up, by the end of his life, he and his father had managed to buy, make, build 50 wooden self-propelled boats. Some of them were skiffs, they had one sailboat and the majority were canoes and they named every single one of them. The flesh batten construction was originated by Thomas Gordon and deserves to have more said about it than I have time for just now. There are only three men who understand how to build such boats. This is why I wish John David was here. Thomas Gordon, Jack Richardson, and Charlie Grills. And those names do indeed rank in canoe construction with the old Italian and German violin makers. And their craft is now a lost art. Pitcher, Stradivarius, etc. <coughs> By the way, I have here a Fitcher violin. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. A fine specimen. I never use it now. And if any of your friends want to buy this, they can go get it. <laughs> uh, George did play the violin. I remember hearing him occasionally. Um, I think I just have one more. Um, and then that Bill talk about. Um, <coughs> sort of random notes I made here about canoe building. Um, and they, I, I've never gone as straight about the number of canoe factories there were in the village and in Peterborough because they did burn, most of them. Um, they got different owners, people went back and forth. <clears throat> but there was a time, and I think this was the early 1900s, um, when Anna Tate, who was E.R. Tate, um, burnt a lot of moles, and I think that was probably out of anger about something. They were stored behind the canoe factory, and uh, he goes on to say, Charlie, this is written I think about 19, maybe in the 30s, Charles Grills is dead now, and with him passed the art of the flesh batten construction. Um, and I, I think if any of you have seen a flesh batten canoe, you know how beautiful they are. We're fortunate to have one that was George Douglas's. Um, and Walter Walker was building them here in the village well, in right. the 60s as, um, as big rowing, uh, big canoes, war canoes. Oh, was he? I didn't batten. realize that. And he built it one for Donald Ross not too many years ago. I think that was the flush batten one that he built. Um, just a couple more things I wanted to say about George Douglas and Lakefield. I mentioned that he had a sailboat. He had a sloop called the Alice. And he sailed that for quite a while. He and my aunt went up the Trent Canal in that in the 20s. And then he would sail it occasionally um, up to the lake. He had a little cottage at the beginning of Stony Lake. But before he died, I think, before they left Northcote Farm, um, he gave that to the Sea Scouts in Lakefield. And so Bill may have some recollections of that. Um, and who was the, the Sea Scout leader? Jenkins? Jacob? Uh, Ken Jenkins. Yeah. Mostly in those days. Yeah. I think Ross so, Wild probably had most to do with the Alice. Oh. But, um, and Mr. Douglas had also built, remember, the little fold up. Yes, he did. Of, yes. Of the skins that he used in the, in, in, when he was cross section. Yes, you're right. Um, I, I'm glad you reminded me of that. And there is still one of those at Northcote. Yes. Yes. So Harry Sheeran got one of them. Mm -hmm. And then I think it ended up in the museum in Cape Yes, it is. Oh, yeah. Um, the um, Dr. Douglas 
they didn't invent the folding uh, canoe, certainly. There had been one, I think, going back to the 1700s. But um, he did make his own designs, uh, and he built um, at least one that he used uh, and went out to the Real Rebellion and used that when the steamer he was on got stuck in a sandbar. But he just unfolded his canoe and went off to see the injured troops. Um, and George built at least a couple of them from that model. And the, the mold is still there, as, as Michael says, at Northcote. Northcote is like Rip Van Winkle. It just, it's asleep um, and nothing has happened to it. But it's wonderful if you're ever there. The shoreline is just amazing. And, and for a child to play there, it was magic for us. And it's wonderful of the Gaspel family to keep it that way. Yes, so, and, and long may it stay that way. Um, so I wanted to mention that about the uh, Alice, was there anything else? I mean, I could talk forever about George, but um, Lakefield meant a great deal to him. Lakefield and Young's Point, he, they were closer to Young's Point than they were to Lakefield. But um, they came here for many, many things, and uh, he always loved the village. Um, when he got too old to paddle down, he would carry on riding a bicycle, and some of you may remember that. He, one thing he was not good at was driving a car. He was rather deaf, and I don't think he could tell when he was changing gears that it wasn't quite the right time. Um, but everything else, he was fine. It, it was just superb. Uh, paddling, rowing, sailing, skating, skiing, didn't really matter. He, he was excellent. Uh, and just a fascinating person to have in the family. So that, uh, that's gone a long way from the Lakefield Wharf, uh, <laughs> I know, but uh, I think if we think of the wharf as the central point for the steamers landing there, taking off the first ones, I think, about 1870, at the same time the rail line came into the village. So it was obviously a very important communication piece for everyone. <clears throat> and, uh, and you just think of the waterway, how so many people have used it and written about it, like Catherine Park Trail and Susanna Moody. Um, the Sea Cadets at the Grove, where Michael was taught for many years. Um, this waterway has meant a lot to a lot of people. Uh, and it's wonderful that people in Lakefield and area are still maintaining it and saving it. I think you've done a, a wonderful job with Imagine the Marsh uh, and keeping that parkland so that uh, um, it's a, it's a, it really is a lovely gem with just enormous history. And everything that you look at here, when, when Bill gets up to talk about his panel of pictures, everything there is a story in itself, whether it's lumber or trains or boats, um, whether it's recreation or whether it is somebody's occupation. It just uh, it means a great deal. So I'm going to turn this over to Bill, who is going to talk, I think, a bit about the regattas. Um, and that's another big story. That <laughs> there are some wonderful, wonderful athletes <coughs> who paddled in, in this uh, area. And there probably still are. OK. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> what I remember about George Douglas before I get on to the wharf is that I was very young and George Douglas used to ride his bicycle into Lakefield. He was such a huge man, tall man, that we were frightened to death of him. We all <laughs> <wanted to hide. laughs> so when George came down on his bike, we all disappeared. <laughs> uh, one other thing about George Douglas, uh, in the scouting, uh, I belonged to the Sea Scouts in the years that they were at Christ Church. And, uh, Ken Jenkins of Wolf Lee were the uh, leaders at that time. And Ken carried on uh, as a leader when they were at the pavilion, the marina pavilion, where the uh, passengers for the steamboats used to, to wait. That was uh, boarded in or filled in and became the, the Sea Scout Hall. Did you went there, Harold? Yep. And uh, George Douglas donated an awful lot of his canoes, I understand, to the Sea Scouts. And I talked to someone recently and wondered where all those canoes have gone and nobody knows. <laughs> Somebody has them somewhere. But <laughs> yeah, they, they will have rotted by now, I should think. Well, unless someone took care of them and, and still used them. But uh, I wanted to address a bit about the wharf. And uh, one of the things I recall is, as a young person, or as a youngster, uh, pre-teens, uh, 
I think most of us uh, ran around in the summertime uh, in our shorts, and that's the way we lived, and we lived around the water and the steamboats and when the trains come in. And I have many great collections of those. And uh, so I tried to put a, a, just a, a little bit of a display together about some of the industry that happened at the board. And one of the biggest industries, of course, was the lumber industry. And uh, the other uh, would be uh, to do with the uh, uh, Neptaline uh, industry mm -hmm. from Nepton. And uh, then I, I wanted to speak a bit about the, the regatta. I found some information in the paper I thought might be interesting and maybe it'll spark somebody's interest in starting regattas again. But uh, as a youngster uh, in the village in those days, you just uh, you hung around the water or you played a bit of sports or you went to scouts. And that was basically it. And so my recollections of, uh, there's a picture over there, the McManus Sawmill, which would have been the last sawmill in the village. Uh, I'd say in the late or in the early 1900s, there was probably 48 sawmills in the area, and it was the last. There's a picture of uh, a group of men that worked at the sawmill, and that's about where Isabel Morris Park is today. There was a bay went in that area, uh, and the sawmill sat on there, and it be a fire or two <coughs> once, once in a while. <laughs> but they used to uh, cut their lumber. They had a steam engine, and the belt-driven saws would cut the lumber, and they would take that steam engine out in the in the uh, uh, the spring of the year, early summer, and they do their threshing. They take that and pull the threshing machines with it as well. So they didn't just do lumber work with it. But, but eventually that burned down, and then they built uh, their last sawmill was up in the corner of Tinger and and uh, Ralston, where my house is. <laughs> and the foundation is still there. And it was run by electricity, but the other was run by, you'd think by water, water the, power, but it was run by the steam engine. How'd they get the logs up there? Just uh, truck them in. They truck them in there. But uh, there's many pictures, there's uh, many, many pictures of the log booms coming down through uh, Ketchumanooka and in, into, the, into the village and into the sawmills. And the largest sawmill in the area was about where the IGA store is now, Cavendish. I think that was the last large one. And uh, so the lumber industry was a huge industry in this community. And it, it basically was built around the wharf area. And... Uh, the lumber was exported to the United States, to Quebec, uh, for boat building in the United States, for, for building uh, buildings. And uh, there's a couple of pictures there um, on the bottom left. You can see stacks of lumber that are much, probably up a couple of stories high. And you'll see the men sitting there on the railway track. And there are several spurs over in this area that started down below the IGA, it probably were uh, Savage Arms, or whatever the arms company is called today, start about there, and they went all the way up to to the marina. So there's several spurs, and they were full of lumber, piles of lumber. So that was the huge industry, and it, that again has to do with the wharf. And Kathy spoke about a little bit about the steamboats, and the tourism was another big industry, like it is today. The steam, the train brought the people in, and there's some pictures here that Sheila has on display that. Uh, show the people at the train station. They're getting off the train to get to the steamboats. And uh, so tourism was a huge industry back in uh, the early 1900s. So the wharf, the wharf was the center place for that as well. And uh, the Neptaline that uh, was uh, mined at Nepton, before they had the village there, before they put the railway line from Havelock up to Nepton, the Nepaline used to be brought down either by trucks that Frank Coyle had, and they're also brought down by a huge uh, wooden barge, or scow as we called it. It was loaded with the Nepaline. Drawn by that thing? By the Waukita. Yeah. The Waukita was a steamboat that uh, drew that. That's all it did was there's two scows. One was loading up at the head of Stony Lake, and they were towing the other one down here, and they go back up, uh, take, uh, go back up and get the other one. And uh, there was a, um, a big clam bucket machine that would unload the scows. 
and either drop it into uh, what we call coal cars, the open cars, and that methylene was trucked uh, or uh, trained out of the area into the United States and so on. Um, great, great white mountains of the stuff I found up here. Yes, if, they, if the train cars weren't there, they just loaded on to, well, where is the Belmore Spark is, and loaded on to the edge there, and uh, that's all um, Eric Holmes did, was unload that, that barge, either in the trail cars or onto the ground, and just kept doing it. That's all he did with that mm -hmm. bucket machine. That went, on, that went on for several years. Then the two barges ended up in Imagine the Marsh, uh, and I played yeah. them on them as a boy at my school. Okay. Uh, they were great fun. We hope you didn't play inside them. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> Kathy tells me she took a wander in there, and if her mother had ever found out, she'd never been allowed near the water again. <laughs> Pitch black in that. You go down one companion way, you dash to the other end of the barge, and you're like, you couldn't see anything. We used to dare each other to do that. <laughs> Varying days, right? Um, so the the lumber industry was the large industry, and so was the naphthalene. And eventually, Lakefield had a small crusher um, just down about where Savage Arms is. Um, they brought the stone down and crushed it there for a period of time. And um, I think that probably all ended about the time the railway went from Havelock up to to Nepton. But I, when, when I was looking at some of those, I recall, um, and I can't remember my age, but I'm going to say around 10 or 12, I used to deliver the Toronto Star. And uh, the manager for the mine came to Lakefield and lived on the second floor of the Lakefield Hotel for a while. Mr. And I used to, pardon? Mr. Cameron. No, Mr. Craig. All right. Okay. And I used to deliver the Toronto Star to Mr. Craig every day up on the second floor of the hotel. <laughs> And uh, also the, with the railway going to the, uh, up to the marina, they used to bring a, a group of railway workers in to service the railway yards. And they would live in bunkies and they had a caboose and they had their own cook. And they used to deliver the Toronto Star there and they'd invite me in and give me a meal and teach me how to play cribbage. <laughs> so I had a few good cribbage around the water, around the wharf, and, and the trains and the boat. But I just, uh, I had an item here I wanted to speak about was the regattas that you might find interesting. And uh, I'll just take this apart. I think the last one that I could find was uh, 21st of July, 1941. Some of the events, uh, there were several events, like the colored poster there, there's, uh, will tell you many things, but I'll just go down through the list that they showed here. There's the canoe marathon, and that left uh, Nassau Mills, and uh, they canoed, I think that was eight miles and five blocks, they had the portage, and uh, the, uh, it was two, uh, two Taylor brothers from Curve Lake that won that race in an hour and 46 minutes, I think it was. Um, there's a lady softball tournament, the ladies swimming. Now, the, 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 on the regattas, you used to swim around the islands. So they had different age groups that swam around the two islands out in front. Um, so there was ladies and boys and girls. And then there was the greasy pole. You might remember some of these names. And then here, it has here Reg Bloomfield. Well, he's well known for his uh, trick canoeing. And there's others in this area known for that as well. Horseshoe pitching, uh, boys single canoe, ladies single canoe, uh, speedboat race, <coughs> um, open crab race. Anybody knows what an open crab race is? That's when you're, is that you're going, you're paddling stern first. Uh, so I've never heard it as an open crab race, but just crab race of equal. Well, open just meant anybody. Oh, open to anybody. Okay, but the crab race, you're Cruise sitting like on, the, on the stern thwart. So the bow is up behind you. So you're standing on the stern? No, no you're, you're, you're sitting. You're sitting, sitting on the stern floor. Oh, I thought I saw them standing on them. Oh. Well, maybe they did. But you know, the thing that's, was, that's very difficult. Any little gust of wind took that great bow and yeah. swung it around, yeah. and you were going yeah. the wrong way. Yeah, you went in the water. <laughs> and that's called the backwater. You could only paddle forward. Okay. <laughs> 
uh, men's swimming race bathing beauty contest. And I have a great picture of the, the winner there. And I'd like you to look at some of the people there. You might recognize a few. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, one or two. Um, tilting contest. Uh, men's single canoe open gunwheel race. What was the open gunwheel? Well, so open just means any age. And gunwheel race, you stood on the gunwheel. Oh, that's me. Right. Uh, You're thinking the other. Okay. Uh, diving contest. Mixed tandem, oh, log, log burling, that'd be interesting. Man, men's tandem, canoe race, uh, speedboat race. Well, the first speedboat race was 20 to 25 miles per hour across. <laughs> and this one's a 35 to 40 mm -hmm. mile per hour class. And then it's got uh, Bill Teller water skiing, so aquaplane with Don Lloyd. Well, those of you around at that time, Don Lloyd had a garage where the current post office is today. And uh, the dairy. Pardon? It was the dairy. Before the dairy. Okay. And uh, um, anybody got a picture of that? Somebody would like to find a picture of that garage, but I recall it very vividly. As a, as a youngster, I run one of so, a case of pop to take home from there. I'll never forget that. <laughs> How could anybody get a case of 24 pop most days? Um, but even his grandchildren are looking for pictures of that garage. But Don. Uh, Don Lloyd had a brand new uh, inboard, what we call speedboat. And <coughs> everyone wondered where Don Lloyd was, how he was able to buy this boat. But anyway, there were two of them on the lake and they had a, had a race that day. So those, those were some of the activities. And uh, just uh, um, it tells about Reg Bloomfield's exhibition of canoe canoemanship. It was a real treat. And the old Lakeville boy was given a fine reception. It goes on some things like that. He did a lot of stunts. Um, it says Bill Tiller won the uh, sing men's single. It goes on down through things like that. The log burling held up till the last found the contestants that had come in from the drives missing. I don't understand that from the drives missing. So Ralph Millage and Clarence Mackwell took the big pine log out and tried their luck. I guess maybe the others wouldn't do it. <laughs> but uh, Clarence Mackwell uh, was an excellent canoeer and won a lot of races up, up, up your way in Stony Lake and around here as well. Uh, I, I grew up with some of his family, he lived just around the corner from me on when I lived on concession. Uh, Don Lloyd with a four-cylinder Chris Craft took the cup for the big inboard class, edging out his former boat, a similar model, by 100 yards on a two-mile run. Um, I don't remember this, but it says Don Campbell with his golf ball driving contest gave the folks a lot of fun. I don't know where he hit the ball, I don't know where, he it, <laughs> where he hit it. But, um, but the highlight of the afternoon was the bathing beauty contest. Uh, <laughs> And if you look at that lady over there, and, you, and she was 18 years old, and you see all those little fellows looking up, you know, <laughs> understand how beautiful she was. Um, and that was held over in the park, over in Hague uh, Park. Uh, they had a, I think, a new tennis court or something over there at that time, and it was held over there. Just uh, prize winners, and I don't know whether it says what they won or just who won. Uh, the canoe marathon was uh, won by uh, Claiborne Taylor and Private John Taylor. Yes, one, one hour, 46 minutes and 40 seconds. And Hiram, Hiram Taylor and Elmo Cofferweight were second at 148. And Doug Mortimer and Dave Wilson of Peterborough were 152. Uh, one hour and 52 minutes. Lady swimming was Nora Weetong and Mary Northey. Boys swimming was Warren Marshall and Oliver Hawley. Uh, boys single canoe was Warren Marshall and Theo Muskrat. Speedboat racing, well we know who won that, Don, Don Lloyd and his new speedboat. Um, 
speedboat race outboard. Uh, it's got Jay Miller from Pittsburgh and, and Clarence McAmorrow. <laughs> the crab race was Don Wilson and Harry Stabler. Men swimming, Alan Marshall. And the Marshalls were, what, first island up on Petrowanuka? Mm -hmm. okay. Is it still Marshall Island? I don't know, but the cottage is still there. <laughs> and uh, uh, tilting contest, uh, uh, Doug Wilson and Doug Mortimer. So the Peterborough boys finally won something. Uh, men's single canoe, Bill Taylor and Dave Wilson. Mixed tandem, Clarence Mack, Moyle and Nora Weetong. Doug Mortimer and Isabel Bullock were second. Men's tandem, Bill Taylor and Clarence Mack, Moyle. Uh, Doug Mortimer and, Doug, um, and Wilson. And the log burling was Ralph Millage and Clarence Mack, Moyle. I'm not sure from that other part of the write-up whether they were only ones, but anyway, they, they would have had fun doing that. So that's just a little bit of a gist of the regatta, uh, what went on, and it was a lot of fun, a lot of events. I don't know whether we could ever find anyone to try and organize <laughs> something like yeah, that we again. Did, we did one in 1979, Bill, when so, Lakefield was 100 years old, okay. and we weren't allowed to run it right along the wharf because there'd been that drowning of the Bullock boy and Dr. Gassel had a thing about salt water drowning and things, so we had it out beyond the point. Oh. And uh, it was a grand affair. Mm -hmm. But it'd be nice to have all it, these kinds of races. It'd be nice to have it back at well, the, at the wharf it? and uh, do the races around the islands and How old? that kind of thing. 79. We're just about 125 years old, aren't we? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. When? Last year, 2000. The village turned 125 in 2000. Hmm? Are you talking about the, the, the wharf or the, no. the village turned 125 in the year 2000? In 2000? Yes. Oh, we had well, a big celebration. Maybe 180 is about as good as 100. <laughs> I mean, 130 is good as good as 25. At any rate, that's, that's uh, just a little bit of uh, history of uh, a couple of the industries that were here, important industries that were here in the community. And we know we didn't speak on tourism. Each one of these could take an evening in itself. But I just thought uh, when I found this article on the uh, regatta, that would be a, a neat thing to do. And hopefully, maybe for your big celebration, Mary, you <laughs> twist somebody's arm to help get a regatta going again for that event. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, I just. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I just want to uh, get Bill and Kay to help a little bit. I was just thinking we need to, there are people here. Uh, I don't think there everyone's exactly familiar with the lay of the land down there at the wharf. And you'll see some photos of um, the one that was in the newspaper with the old uh, train uh, pavilion where people waited when they got off the train to, before they got on the steamer and their luggage. There was a, even a separate little... Um, a structure for their luggage to sit under. You'll see it in some of the old photos, one of the photos in the history book. But, um, and it was the same way if they came down on the steamer, they'd wait, and there is a twin of that pavilion at Juniper Island. Right. So help me, Kay, if I'm wrong here. But, but, but I think it's important for the people who don't know that that pavilion got moved back in around, was it uh, uh, early, um, it was in the 80s that the I believe the village moved it over into Isabel Morris Park. It's a it's a designated historic structure, and uh, we had a, a lakak at that time in the village, and um, so it sits in Isabel Morris Park, not where it originally was, as you'll see it in the photos here. But uh, I'm sorry that John David couldn't be here because um, I wish he, I could remember the date. I think. And, and maybe you can help me, Kay. But one really important thing about the wharf that I learned early on was how critical, or how interesting, as you said about the politicians, so too when it comes to commuting to and from the, co the cottage. Because back in the 1800s, people would leave their cottage, and J.D. was telling me this story um, about how they would even leave at three in the morning from Juniper Island on the Monday morning catch the steamer, get into Lakefield, get on the train, and be at their offices in downtown Toronto. They left the family behind for the week at Stony Lake, 
and be at their office in time for the door opening of their office in downtown Toronto. And that's so remarkable back in the 1800s when you think about it. And, and they did the same thing on the Friday night as well to be with their families. So it really, this was the point where they did the switch over both ways. So I don't know whether you want to add anything about about the whole business of uh, the cottage connection that Lakefield was. And, and it is to this day when you think about how critical um, uh, Lakefield is the hub for cottagers commercially. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, do you want to speak to that? Okay. Um, yeah, I've always thought of, if, if we could just go back in time, I'd love to do that. <clears throat> One of the pictures I have is of the Empress, I think it is, coming into my grandparents' wharf on Mackenzie Bay. Uh, my grandfather didn't get in, in that early on a Monday morning, but uh, he would walk out as anybody would who wanted to flag the steamer. They had a, a, a little pole with a white flag on it. So the steamer came in and you got on. Um, he would have breakfast on the steamer going down to Lakefield. And the woman who was the cook for the Stony Lake Navigation Company, I think was a cook during the winter at the Grove. Uh, my aunt told me this. Um, and coming back on Friday, he would have supper on the steamer. And when he got to the cottage, it was about 8 o'clock, and the children would be all ready for bed, and he'd be fed. And I, what a civilized way to travel. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. This is such a shame. Um, but another thing that comes to mind, too, and I found this out from my father, was that they would uh, take the laundry out. They'd paddle the laundry out, the, the Wiley Greer is my father's uncle where my father would stay, <clears throat> also in Mackenzie Bay, it wasn't deep enough for the steamer. So they would paddle out to the steamer if they had something to deliver, and it would be a dunnage bag of laundry. And the steamer would take that, drop, drop that off at Young's Point, and there was some kind lady in Young's Point who did the laundry and sent it back about a day later. <laughs> Nobody does that anymore. <laughs> you know, although I do uh, remember, and, and I don't want to ramble too much, but one of the clergymen at St. Peter's on the Rock said, he thoroughly enjoyed coming down to the uh, the laundry, the automatic laundry in, in Lakefield to wash. <laughs> At about six o'clock in the morning when it opened, he'd get his globe and mail, he'd sit there, nobody was bothering him, and the laundry was going round and round the machine, and he'd get it out in time and go home, back to the cottage. So maybe there are some of these uh, um, civilized gentilities still around in a different format. but. Uh, it, it certainly was a way to travel, and you hear people who came from Rochester um, would be leaving, they'd take a streetcar to their steamer dock, they'd leave maybe the day before, and it might be midnight before they got to their cottage, but the, the steamer would land and somebody would unload their uh, baggage and get them in there. And When Christy and I were researching for the book, we just heard this story over and over again from so many families mm -hmm. of how important the steamer was and, and the uh, the crews and the captains and, and, and they arrived with the whole summer with the did. trunks of linen and the trunks oh, yes. of food everything yeah. everything the whole for two months yes and they may have arrived at midnight as you said and then they had to undo all the mouse proofing oh and yes et cetera, et cetera. that's right <laughs> and if the screens weren't galvanized you had to, to wipe them down with a mixture of oil and <laughs> yeah. something or other right. <laughs> so it, yeah it wasn't always pleasant but the, the children did their tasks in the morning and uh, um, and then they had the rest of the day to play so there's a lot to be said for that anyway um there's just so much that can be written and, and talked about about this whole area. And I think we're fortunate that there are so many people who have saved pictures and stories and records. And it's not going to be lost. So um, anyway, that's probably enough for me. Thank you. Um, and just uh, one other note, too. I don't know whether people are aware, uh, some would be, that there are actually two federal wharfs in Lakefield. And we call it the Lakefield Upper Federal Wharf, Upper. And John, can, you can help me if I'm incorrect in the exact uh, naming of this. John Millage knows all about these uh, details. But the one down at the end of Block Road is also a federal wharf. It's in Duro Dummer. And uh, I haven't heard any rumblings about the, the government uh, wanting to turn it over to them as they did the Juniper Island yes. federal wharf. Mm -hmm. They did fix it up and the Viamede one. Mm -hmm. I guess they called it the Mount Julian one. Yes. Uh, but uh, so. And McCracken says they did turn that over as well. Park, yeah. Okay. 
but, uh, but the one below Lake Field, I haven't really heard any history on that uh, wharf at the end of Block Road, but there was a purpose, I'm sure, for, for the loading of uh, a coal dock. A coal dock? When Bill, one of the ice community members was there, but I always viewed it as a coal dock. So I, I think it was used by some of the Does anybody want to add any other stories about the uh, Lakefield Wharf, or do you have any questions that maybe Kay or Bill could uh, answer? I'm going to ask John Millage to tell a little story that he told me on the telephone the other night. It has to do with uh, a photo that he found to do with the uh, wharf. Did you bring that photo with you? Oh, I have it, but I'll, it's, it's up there. It's okay. the one where, the, where the, you can see the narrow, you just see the corner of the pavilion. Okay. Can you tell us the history of this photo? It's not so much the, uh, it's not so much the, the photo, which is here, but it's a picture postcard. And the postcard, I have it, it's in my pocket right there. The postcard was sent from Lakefield in 1914 to uh, a lady by the name of McClintock. Uh, and it, it, it went to, to, to uh, Canton, Ohio, from Lakefield. And about 10 years ago, I purchased it from a card collector at an antiques show oh, here in the village. <laughs> and that was what, what, what the unique part Jean, to come and share your thoughts with us. What I felt was that it's just opened the door. Mm -hmm. We could just go on forever, and it would be a real thrill to just break down the thoughts that we had tonight and spend an evening just in one component. And our door is always open and we would just love to have you come back. We appreciate so much the time that you gave. And now that we have the displays of photos up from the stories that you have heard so far, you can now go and look through them with a little bit more information that, uh, from, from our talk tonight. <coughs> and at the same time, have some coffee and cookies and enjoy what, um, what you've heard. Also, as I mentioned before, uh, at the end of each meeting, when we have taped the conversation, then uh, Sheila, our secretary extraordinaire, types this out. So we have a, re a record uh, for people to uh, read about and share. And also, we're really in uh, competition with Hollywood because we have our uh, <laughs> extraordinaire video. Get away, get away. <laughs> and we have these as copies for our records too. So we, we hope whatever we can do to celebrate the joy of Lakefield and share this with everyone. And that's what we continue to do. So it's nice to see so many people out. Photographs at the station tender? Uh, yes, we have started one, uh, a couple of fundraising beside the book. Um, we have a series of photographs now that are going to be at the uh, station, we have the Glovers here, do we? Yes, and uh, they have very kindly uh, been able to uh, frame some of our photos and those will be for sale there. Another thing we are going to do is have a raffle, uh, which will go on throughout the season until Christmas. And the raffle will be on one of our photos, which will be framed in um, a very beautiful way by the Glovers. And this will be, uh, as, as I say, as a raffle and a fundraiser too for the season. Um, so again, 
I plead for you to do your spring cleaning, check the attics, <laughs> check the basement, and also if you have a topic that you would like to hear, please let us know so that we can have enjoyable evenings like this. Uh, time marches on and we want to have these things to share. So again, um, help yourselves and go around and uh, look at all the photos that are available. And thank you so much.